Marina Roy is a Vancouver-based writer and artist and associate professor in visual art at the University of British Columbia. Her artwork investigates the grotesque at the intersection of language, image, and materiality, and her research interests include ecology, post-humanism, psychoanalysis, and biopolitics. She explores humor through the through a corporeal register, humans underlying anim animality and mortality, as well as the of humanist moral positions vis-a-vis -vis life on this planet. She has shown nationally and internationally. Roy was a recipient of the Viva Award in 2010. Uh, in 2001, she published Sign After the X, uh, Arsenal uh, and Art Speak, um, uh, under Advanced Editions, I, I think, uh, a, a book that revolves around the letter X and its multiple meanings. Today, we're launching her newest book, Q Jumping, which is published by Information Office uh, and Art Metropole, um, and uses the letter Q as a device to investigate such interwoven issues as the invention of language and art and the shifting nature of sovereignty, feminist ut utopias, ecological devastation, and animal, animal extinction. Uh, I'd like to extend a personal thanks to Derek Barnett, Emma Walters, and Paloma Lam, and Marina, of course. Um, please welcome Marina Roy. So I'm going to also put this microphone Thank you, Jonathan. I mean, this is great. Um, John, I, I approached Jonathan way back when <laughs> about um, publishing this book. And and then Jonathan was like, yeah, um, information office should do it and let's apply for a grant and get the money. And so, and then it just kind of things fell into place. And then things took a little longer because of COVID, but it's just such a beautiful book. So thank you, Jonathan, for making it happen and being so supportive and for um, inviting me to come and and uh, launch the book here today. And thanks to to Derek, of course, for this beautiful object and to Emma and Paloma Lum for all the, like, just, like, can you imagine editing this? I mean, I read it so many times and it took me a week at a time to read the whole thing. It was really yeah, I don't actually ever want to read it again. <laughs> it's my tombstone. It's like da da, but you know, it's always nice to crack it open and um, find places to um, enjoy again. Uh, yeah, so the book started when I pretty much when I started teaching at UBC as uh, assistant professor, and so I feel that it has been um, a, some writing that has continued throughout my teaching of, uh, of contemporary theory and art history. And I also have a degree in French literature. So that kind of makes this appearance in there. Some of my ink drawings, some of my um, community of artists are within here. So I feel that it's a very personal book. It has a lot to do with my development as an academic and as an artist. And uh, so it, feel, it feels like it kind of sums up 17 years, which is also the incubation period of um, of a cicada, you know, it kind of ferments underground. And, you know, for the longest time, I was like, should I put stuff up on, um, you know, should I put it up on, on a blog and get feedback? But no, I mean, part of it was this kind of, I wanted to keep the, 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 the writing, um, very private until the moment I could bring it out. And in a way, um, I was able to, you know, share bits and pieces with friends along the way, but basically it's my cicada emergence and then giving it to the world. And 17 is also the 17th letter of the alphabet and there are 17 chapters. And um, yeah, it took 17 years to write. So I feel like 17 became this kind of talismanic thing that I found out kind of at the end. Right. I was like, I didn't realize until anyway. And then it took a couple of years more to get it published. But anyway, in terms of writing, and then I did insert something for um, during the uh, pandemic. I I always knew in the back of my mind, I wanted to um, 
write something for quarantine, but I thought, well, I don't want to just write another piece that's like about what quarantine is. And then the, um, yeah, just the opportunity presented itself to actually write about what it felt like to be ended. And now it feels very dated. You know, when you read those things and you're like, oh my God, that was what we did. And it felt so special at the time. Now we're just like, oh my God, yeah, that's what we did. Um, so I'm cracking open this fresh book. I didn't, I didn't carry it with me because um, I wanted to travel light. <laughs> so thank goodness I have it. Many copies here to choose from. Thank you so much. Um, so seeing as probably most, most of you haven't read it, um, I feel like it's kind of important to start with the first chapter, maybe not the intro, but the first part called Q jumping. So that you can get a sense of, um, what it means, why I chose this. Um, so I was thinking, so for the longest time, it was just, um, you know, this kind of generic Q, cues. I don't know. I didn't know what to call it. And then as it often happens with me, kind of smack in the middle of my time writing it, the word cue jumping, I hear it and I went, whoa. Okay, so it it speaks to one of my pet peeves and to overpopulation and like too many people. And then also like, and then during quarantine time, like the cue jumping really was an interesting thing. So I got to make a drawing where that we were close together and then far apart. Um, and then, um, yeah, and then I, I I realized that Q jumping became this uh, this figure, this this kind of really potent word that could speak to many things. Um, I thought of it metaphorically as how humans jump ahead evolutionary over everything else, right? So like so we've Q jumped ahead exponentially, really quickly, um, to the point where like so many other species are like not sharing space with us anymore. So it was kind of a negative metaphor, but um, or allegory. So I'll start with a quotation um, by uh, Timothy Morton. And then this is the image that faces it. It is um, uh, Didasus um, Validus, The Great Chain of Being from 1579. And I think I, I think Kika was telling me about this image at one point. And so, and then I remember looking at it and thinking, yeah, yeah. So yeah, many people are influenced me in this book, including Kika. And, and she also has a, a little chapter in there that near the end, under the quantum, I think. Okay, so this is Timothy Morton. Nature is precisely the lump that pre-exists the capitalist labor process. Martin Heidegger has the best term for it, standing reserve, the stand. The stand means stuff. The stand is stockpiling, gallon after gallon, of oil waiting to be tapped, row upon row of big box houses waiting to be inhabited, terabyte after terabyte of memory waiting to be filled. Stockpiling is the art of zugma, the yoking of things you hear in phrases such as wave upon wave or bumper to bumper. Stockpiling is the dominant mode of social existence, giant parking lots empty of cars, Huge tables and restaurants across which you can't hold hands. Vast empty lawns. Nature is stockpiling. Range upon range of mountains receding into the distance. The rocky flats. Nuclear bomb trigger factory was cited precisely to evoke this kind of mountainous stockpile. The eerie strangeness of this fact confronts us with the ways in which we still believe the nature that nature is over there that it exists apart from technology, apart from history, far from it. Nature is the stockpile of stockpiles. Q jumping. I use Q jumping as a figuration to delineate how human histories have come to outfox natural histories. I use it to identify and delineate the human desire to jump ahead of others, especially non-human beings, in the, cult in the cultural and evolutionary sense. It is not just a question of etiquette. We are dealing with life and death issues, budding, barging, budging, cutting in, skipping ahead and ditching the suckers. At first, this might manifest itself as the survival tactic and only later as defiance towards spatiotemporal management. For whatever the reason, the cue jumper feels entitled. At one point, our primate, primate ancestors stood upright 
hands-free, exposing their faces and sexes to, the ver to a vertically directed world. They roved about, squandered energy, invented tools, sparked fires, made vestments, investments, communicated through vocalizations, then, through more elaborate expression, sang songs, conducted rituals to attenuate impulses and traumas, fashioned pictures to tell stories, mapped out beliefs, and transcribed memories. Created was a growing queue of symbols. The branches they had swung upon were chopped down for aesthetic sake. All that was left was a stump to sit on while they rested, sweating or waiting, to be forgotten soon enough. The fertile field stretched far beyond the horizon, over time becoming little more than dust swept up by the wind, to leave them all behind in the dust. I'm just going to jump, Q jump ahead. So that wasn't the full one, but um, maybe I will. Um, okay. I think this quotation, it's okay. The interesting thing about this book also is that <laughs> the footnotes go up to like over a thousand at the end. So it's a kind of a queue of <laughs> footnotes. It doesn't. <laughs> So I have to actually check. I think um, I'm trying to remember the name of the author too. So, so it becomes a bit of a Jonathan Crary, right? This Jonathan Crary is this um, next. There's a lot of uh, quotation with Q um, in here as well. I do have a section on quotation. Um, okay, so this is kind of a subsection of the same chapter. So Jonathan Crary says, the waiting that one actually does now in traffic jams or airport lines acts to intensify resentment and competitiveness with those nearby. One of the superficial but piercing truisms about class society is that the rich never have to wait. And this feeds the desire to emulate wherever possible, this particular privilege of the elite. Cue jumping is an appropriate action image of stealing time for those of us in a hurry to get there, but never able to get ahead. It is a behavior stemming from population density, inadequate urban infrastructure and planning, and the attendant ennui of such a quotidian experience, driving in traffic, lining up to pay for your groceries, waiting on the phone for customer service with the automated voice telling you that your call might be monitored for quality control. The mounting minutes spent idle bloom into fits of restlessness. You stare at the back of someone's head or a bumper sticker. You listen to cloying music on hold. There may be darting looks or an avoidance of eye contact altogether. It is important to find ways of feeling as, distance, as distant from the herd as possible. There is the burden of slow down time. There is the dead weight of it. Your mind turns to the destination, the conspicuous suburban house with grassy lawn, or now more commonly the condominium towered, that condominium tower nestled in smog that makes worthwhile the long hours spent in bottlenecks. Not to mention your own personal treadmill the irony of millions of years of putrefied organic matter, all that transmogrified sunshine consumed within and beneath as you crawl along that asphalt strip day after day to work and back again, to the land of make-believe and back again, living the dream straight off the assembly line, ported away, then off to the landfill. Any requests? <laughs> yeah, I could do that one. Yeah. What do you think? I mean, you feel comfortable? I I'll, I'll re oh yeah, it's also yours. It's yours too. Um, why don't I write, read a poem first? Um, so this, uh, this poem, it might, yeah, 
don't know if I should tell you. I'll tell you after. In and out of the hole. Okay, so it there's some line breaks, but it's nothing too groundbreaking. Okay. So I'll kind of pause at the line breaks. Um, I'm not a poet, but I, I'm interested in making myself vulnerable. Um, and yeah, this one is kind of more about language. Um, as if perfect, continuous, Ouroboros, Soroboro, a sphere, a hole, a zero, flipping, coiling, looping on itself, somersaulting, and jumping round and round, the carbon ring, eternally returning. An empty space, surrounded by an outer membrane, a wall, a well-guarded precinct, but then a projectile inserts itself, or rather, a prosthesis attaches, offering a route into and out of the open, a bridge over a moat, as seen from above or below. A needle penetrates, giving birth to a new economy, a volatile chemical quickening the bloodstream. One is born into it, but then down a hole one falls, the O stretches out, becomes I, cracked open, eyes locked. You see, the I is rarely complete without you, which is always rendered lower, the subordinate, subordinate of the two, the capital being nothing without the lower, the king and the jester, Don Quixote and Sancho Panza. The one draws all the attention while the other abets subserviently. As a unit, it always puts its best foot forward, ready to trip you. Cigarette rests on an ashtray, it beckons for you to take long drags. You do intermittently, putting it back, allowing the smoke trail to idle. A queue of people enters an arena. As they do, they nudge the person in front, just a little, to keep things moving forward. You drive off the plank. Oh, sorry. You dive off the plank into a circular pool. A cock peeks out from sagging spandex, takes a look around, a rock has fallen on a dog, now only a tail there. A snail leaves a trail, a line of mucus on the pavement. A ponytail bobs up and down, one only sees the back of the head. Many sperm escape, but only one gets lassoed. He sees himself as the last letter on authority, judgment, measure, rationality, empiricism. In school, you would write it over and over again, variations on the same, a stick propping the enclosed loop on a blue line, over time switching it this way and that, making it drift on an ocean wave or spin off the sheet, invented Baroque. It started as the initial letter on a contract, a code ensuring inseparability of blood and soil, more often than not used to rationalize an agenda. Little did they know, power has no legs. Pull on its tail and out pops the stuffing, floating off into ether, left behind an aperture, a wound, maybe a few sinews left hanging, a remainder of a reminder of a recursive nature. It may well grow a new one. You swim out far, feeling finally set loose from the father. So that was kind of my visualization of the letter Q through just things in the world and situations. Um, who knows why we write this way? <laughs> and then there's a kind of an image of um, some cues, some calligraphy. I, I'm not very good at it, but I have fun doing. The, the great thing about this book also is I made drawings over and over again. So I actually created a, a drawing practice where I would draw the same thing over and over again until I felt like I had it right. And so I have sometimes 10 drawings of the same thing. And then, um, and that was really fun too, to, to create a new way of drawing that was about repetition for this book. <laughs> um, yeah, there's, there's a really fun um, one called Tel Alasha Oku. And 
all about um, Duchamp, Duchamp's piece, and let's see. Yeah, I'm going to do that. I, I had that in my mind. Um, I also wonder, we, oh, no, I won't do that one. Or maybe just like a tiny, tiny short one. The shortest one. Um, which section is it in? I think it's in Quadli Bet. It's hard to remember now where things are. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. So uh, there's like a memoir piece here called Que de Chien, if you ever get a chance to read it. Um, it is accompanied by this, this drawing of a rock that is fallen onto a dog and only its tail is showing. And it's kind of related to the story. But I feel um, it was a really traumatic moment in my childhood. I don't feel like reading it. But I'll read uh, a dream that it reads a recurring after after um, this one is a piece called Dead Puppies, super short. Every few months, I dream that I have left a litter of newborn puppies in a bag in my school locker. Sometimes it is another set of animals or a collection of insects in a box. One paradigm is exchanged for another, but the structure remains the same. The following scenario repeats. I have, I'm supposed to take care of them, but instead of taking care, taking them home, I've forgotten them in my locker, and so they have starved to death. For some reason, I can barely remember where my locker is and wh what number is mine. I get more and more anxious, walking round and round, unable to find it. Which floor is it on? Which hallway? I know that I need to find it and deal with this pile of death. When I finally find my locker, I am filled with dread at what I will find, the stench of slow death. The seething remains of abject neglect. And that's true. I, I dream that all the time. I dream that I've left something and it's dead and I have to deal with it. And I'm so anxious in the dream. You know how we always dream the same thing? It's anyway, it felt apt. And so back to can go to the feminist section. Let me just go to the actual index. The index is a really, really beautifully done. It's just like Oh, it was the last thing done because it because it's quite daunting, wasn't it? Um, okay, it's under the chapter Queen, which has a wonderful um, section on uh, feminist utopias. But I'm going to read quadragenarian and quick quinquagenarian, which is the 40s and 50s. 40s and 50s. What page is it? 243. Should I read the whole thing? It's not that long. Quadragenarian and quinquagenarian. So this is um starts with a quotation by Marguerite Dura. And then a second quotation by Beckett, Samuel Beckett. One day I was already old in the entrance of a public space of a public place. A man came up to me. He introduced himself and said, I've known you for years. Everyone says you were beautiful when you were young. But I want to tell you, I think you're more beautiful now than ever. Rather than your face as a young woman, I prefer your face as it is now, ravaged. Second quotation by Beckett. To decompose is to live too. And then the rest is me. Of course, it was inevitable. You thought one day it will be there. And then one day there it was. The drab silhouette, the fatuous flesh. You shuffle down sidewalks shedding. Your interests lag. Your profile sags, while they, glued to their devices, swarm around the freshest droppings. Your brain has encountered novelty on the heels of obsolescence. At times, it involves a simple dusting off of dissuetude to stand in for the new. 
It has happened too many times to take these signs too seriously. The acceleration falls almost immediately to waste following the money. Fine are the swifter ones. They have a nose for it, are bred into it. Only the latest fashions will do. You refuse to throw your clothes away, settling into shabby, holy. When you stop being visible, alive to the trends, you are finally able to make something of significance. With the slow decomposition, new insights hatched. You were not yet milk toast. Once you hit a certain age, your presence feels hackneyed. You become a collector of creeks, and a clatter of confabulations spills forth. They find the topic unsavory. Do not remind me, they say. Except for if you want to impart any wise words on health supplements and therapies. The turtleneck. The yoga lattes. Low-fat lattes. The vested sweat. The perfume. To be centered and exhale. The aging body is, by turns, lugubrious, ridiculous, prodigious. You are not opposed to shining a light on the biological facts, looking at the pear-shaped reality square in the face. So next section. Oh, this is by Lisa Robertson, this quotation in a book called She Dandy. Menopause turns females into dandies. Some of your organs become purely self-referential. They have no further potential for family or spectacle or state. They're outside every economy. So now their meaning is confected in relation to convivial and autonomous pleasure only. Now they can be in the present fully. I'm assuming the mind is an organ or a kind of wandering gland in this description. The hormones the, ov the ovaries use to make are now made by all the parts of the body so that every tissue, every limb and fold continuously in invents its own mode of transformation. The entire body becomes a fungible thinking whose purpose it is only to express its own communicability for the pleasure, the intensity and integrity of it. So this is me now. The beginnings of decay the non-reproductive years, the counter-narrative of pubescence, a life in reverse, lost elasticity, a softening of mass under the chin, a slight drooping of the cheeks, producing what they call jowls, longer in the mouth, deepening laugh lines crowding around the mouth, prominent furrows around brow, forehead and eyes, a pooling sallowness around the orbs, Brindle patches, large pores, a pastier or ruddier aspect. Those evenings quaffing red wine released burst cat capillaries. Have not the eyes gone a bit dull? Readers, drivers, progressives, all breaking the bank. Receding gums, teeth graying and yellowing, starting to look transparent. Lost luster. Long strands clogging the drains, a strange ropiness, taut tendons extending from the base of the jaw down to the clavicle, turkey neck. The puckering little bulge between armpit and upper arm, dewlaps, fatty deposits beneath armpits, spilling out over the bra. <laughs> Sorry. The hands and chest, liver spotted white and red polka dots on the arms, the boobs head south, sitting, the bulges roll and rest on one another, like the Michelin man. A cellulite texture begins to show up on the inner thighs. The fingers and toenails show signs of going brittle. Your knees and elbows look like an elephant's. The veins puff out and the tendons protrude on the thinning skin on hands and feet. Your feet and legs ache. With estrogen lowering, osteoporosis starts to set in, along with rheumatoid or osteoarthritis. The cartilage in the knees has worn down. The back gives out more frequently. The ankles click. The neck cricks. The posterior muscle mass has fallen into a billowy pancake. The genital lips less firm. And the sex drive in decline. Orgasm visits you in dreams amidst half-baked creatures and lost loves. 
you're likely to start having to take medication for one reason or another for the heart, cholesterol, blood pressure, vitamin B12 deficiency, diabetes, menopause, thyroid dysfunction, and so on. If you have had a life of drinking and smoking, expect to start feeling lousier. Liver and lungs will eventually let you down as cells deteriorate. The body is just not able to regulate chemicals, chemical levels as efficiently as it used to. As you enter Death Canyon, anomalous cells are likely are more likely to grow. If their growth explodes, you have no chance but to enter deeper into it. A void opens up where the name used to be. You forget having met certain people. Were you drunk at the time? Are you just not all that memorable? Are they all are they just not all that memorable? Or is it that your brain cells are dying? You imagine gaps open up in your great matter like you have seen in medical imaging, shorter in the day, week, month, and year, time eaten up by quickening. You smoke more to forget. You think, fuck it, and empty the bottle of red. At least this way, time passes with some levity, some jollity. The visible and sensible effects of age are one thing. The science behind it isn't quite another. Cells are slower to divide as they age. Aging seems related to the shortening of tel telomeres, which protect the ends of chromosomes from deteriorating. Telomeres appear to shorten with each cell division. At one point, they will be so short that cells become too vulnerable and die. We are biologically programmed to age. Some species of organisms show negligible signs of aging. Sturgeons, rockfish, quahogs, sea anemones, and the bristlecone pine, for example. Aging is integral to life itself, happening at different rates for different species. In the case of humans, one, once one passes the prime procreation years, ending around 35, the body, the body begins to decline. Reproductive cell cycle theory claims that aging is regulated by reproductive hormones that maintain cellular growth in your younger years and then decline in later years. Estradiol and other estrogen hormones decrease sharply after menopause. Human growth hormone is naturally produced in the pituitary gland. It decreases as a person gets older. Anti-aging doctors often prescribe it. H HGH, that is, human growth hormone. Uh, DNA damage theory treats aging as if it were a disease. There is a greater risk of disease as one gets older, and so aging is often described as a disease. Why can't it just be a part of the natural biological life cycle as it is for other organisms? Human narcissism and thanatophobia are at the center of this theory, especially in terms of how it can be capitalized upon. The idea that even aging can be stalled or even fixed is not surprising, as a dominant ideology states that human lives, and especially certain human lives, are precious. If only they could see human death itself as a continuum with life, our raw materials decomposing and furthering the possibility of other life by feeding worms and the microorganisms, which give life to soil and give freely of their life's labor, human death is overrated. That's a quotation by um, Rosie Bredotti. Um, is that good? There's another section on it. But I think the fun part is over. The, my own aging body. Um, yeah, so Kika. Yeah. Is that the end here, the end? work. Kika's work. So it was a bit of a crass phrases that could kind of describe it, I think. But it's important for you to see it, obviously. So it's called Torque, Kika Thorne's Singularity. And the first uh, First quotation is by um, quantum cultural theorist, you know, hmm? Bukemba. 
And then the second quotation is a very short one by Kikafor. You you let me use it. It's beautiful. And it's very short. Okay, first quotation by Barad. You see, I was talking about the memory lapse. That's the age of you now. In an important sense, touch is the primary concern of physics. Its entire history can be understood as a struggle to articulate what touch entails. How do particles sense one another? Through direct contact and ether, action at a distance, forces, fields, the exchange of virtual particles. What does the exchange of energy entail? How is a charge in motion affected? What is pressure? What is temperature? How does the eye see? How, does, how do lenses work? What are the different kinds of forces that particles experience? How many kinds are there? What is the nature of measurement? Once you start looking at it this way, you get a dizzying feeling at, as things shift. This particular take on physics and its history entails a torquing, a perturbation of the usual storylines. This is fair description and worth considering in the ways it opens up new possibilities for thinking about both the nature of physics and of touch. And then Kika, the magnetic moment is a torque, a turning force in the core of the magnet. The torque is produced by the spin of each elementary particle. The magnetic field extends in direct proportion to the strength of the interior torque. And so it's important to realize that this very elegant and beautiful form is produced like that joining in the middle is the earth magnets, right? So there's a torque right there. Um, and then this is my writing on the singularity. She left behind a postcard of singularity. For years now, it has rested on the bookcase where I look at it daily. I often find myself thinking about what the work expresses and means. Two pieces of lycra, one black and one pink, have their corners stretched out taut, anchored to the eight corners of a white room, but also at a ninth central point, where they are locked in a magnetic kiss. Ten arc-shaped fields materialize through extreme tension, the result of so much energy transfixed at nine points. As my eyes travel along the central zone of consummate intensity, where north meets south and south meets north, where space-time warps form in that magnetic attraction, two fields dissolve into a new dimension, a suspended fuck, two quadrupeds fused, a pulsating optical pleasure. Have you ever experienced such a feeling so full to bursting that one is driven to fuse with the other with the risk of never coming back? Another thing that Thorne's singularity does is map out a three-dimensional diagram it is a theoretical rendition of the black hole's existence made physical along X, Y, and Z axes. The negative space around singularity's form vibrates with mute potential. Whichever way you look, you see two half ellipses, par parabolas of empty space, touching the edges of pink and black arcs that meet at the stretch and squeeze point of gravitational singularity. This singular central point represents an acute dense mass of an infinite small space. In actuality, the singularity or black hole remains forever hidden from view behind the event horizon. Thorne has made it visible for us here as two magnets attracted to infinity, never ending loops circulate around the magnetic dipole circuit. The event horizon that arcs away from the extreme points of tension acts like a stretchy membrane once a particle enters into enters its it, once a particle enters its realm there is no turning back as it moves inevitably closer to the black hole space time distorts the particle appears to slow down as it gets sucked into the singularity again humans will never be able to observe this event unfolding through use through using the technology driven synthetic material lycra a material originally fabricated by dupont 
Singularity points to plastic's potency, its dominance to the point of filling the four corners of the earth with an elasticity that has spread and seeped everywhere and into everything. Once introduced, its volatile fumes and microfilaments are virtually impossible to extricate from the air, water, soil, and food chain. So entangled is the material in our life world now that our chances of escaping its effects are next to nil. This resilient tension is what groups grounds the work, the explicit display, being pulled together apart, a flashpoint of emergence and decay, sucked into its positive negative pull, touching and not touching, close to snapping point. At the As the dire warnings get louder, one finds that all profit-seeking corporations continue to have a field day, converting everything from natural material to synthetic in a last-ditch attempt to profit before disaster hits and a fine-tuned network we came to take for granted comes to an end. We teeter at the tipping point of no return. Once past it, there will be no slowing down. There will be no reversal to the previous state. A massive nihilism speaks of the new normal and shrugs. They surreptitiously name synthetic materials by myriad dynamic names, polyester, nylon, rayon, organza, taffeta, elastane, elastral, lycra, modal, and spandex. The latter is an acronym, an anagram, sorry. The latter is an anagram of the word expands. When one wears plastic hosiery, one's crotch fuses with the universe. The fibers are marketed as lightweight and flexible for sporting activities, while also being shimmery sexy in how it clings to the body. The deception is complete. It is cheap filler that in every t in very little time looks shitty and disintegrates, microfilaments breaking off and contaminating the life world. In the end, ubiquitous will be those traces of petrochemicals that infuse every aspect of our lives. They will outlive all the fleshy matter, releasing it in so many ghostly forms. They are the results of so much profane and instrumental suffering living on, in, or as humus. Will the final indignity of historical memory, whether natural or cultural, be a general eclipse of this once diverse life by endless tendrils of microplastics as they become entangled into a new alien life form. What to make of this confluence of black holes and lycra? We could stretch the membrane of interpretation as far as it could go before it tears. While black holes are born with the collapse of stars, swallowing up everything in their wake, not even light can escape their gravitational pull. The world's ecosystem is collapsing from holes opening up in lycra. The world is now suffocating in petrochemical derivatives. What was once life proliferating under the blazing sun has sunk deep into the earth, and we are digging it all up again and burning it like there was no tomorrow. The worm turns, torques, and bites its own tail. I was trying reading that again. I'm always so afraid to read things because I think oh, it doesn't meet up. So I'm always surprised reading it again. <laughs> that's it. I think that's that was a good chunk of time, eh? That's great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So we probably have some time for questions if yeah. if uh, possible. And I'll let people know uh, if they can hear me on the text state of the microphone. So um people online please uh oh. i've been sitting a bit today so if you don't mind i'll just yeah okay um i'll relay any questions that are that are just coming through the yeah but uh yeah oh i do have uh So there is a question here from Randy who says, um, are there Q topics you would add to the book? That's uh, question number one. 
question number two is how do you think about the relation of the images drawing etc to the writing yeah those are good questions of course um so yeah i wanted to include quartzite in the book because that's the form that vitamin takes like when you when you pull it first excavate it out of the ground like deep in the ground and um the Ath Athabasca um oil sands um there it's in the form of quartzite so that was like a missed opportunity but I you know I can I can include it in because at the back of the book there's like a QR code and so I can actually like uh upload a lot of information there like, for things that um come up so that's one that I wish I'd put in for sure and then the drawings um the drawing, like I made a lot of drawings. I actually had a dream like last week that the, the book had a lot more drawings and it was great, but there was too much writing. <laughs> Probably should have forfeited more of the writing for more drawing, but but yeah, so so the drawings um, came out of the writing and it was an exploration of uh, ink washes. And I learned a lot about ink washes in doing it. And um yeah, it's just for whatever reason, I, I I actually don't know why. Um, the ink washes seem to be like ink drawing and ink washes seem to be um lend itself best for how I wanted to illustrate it. And then there are lots of images of other people's work in it too. Um so I didn't want it to just be my drawing, I wanted it to be about other people's work. But um yeah, I made I made probably like double the amount of drawings and then just kind of decided to put just a few of them in like maybe there are you know, 20 images of ink drawings 25 maybe not sure why we do what we do we just kind of make decisions that you know kind of like making art like why do we do this a lot of it's intuition but in the dream I was really happy there were more images <laughs> So yeah, um, there isn't like a one-to-one -one ratio in terms of why the drawings are what they are, but they do illustrate in some way the the book quite directly. The the drawing I showed you of the of the dog swished by the rocks, one of my favorite drawings. So simple. It took me a long time to get it right. So I was pretty happy with it. Now you have to read the story to get the <laughs> I'm giving you a little suspense. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, um, can you um tell us what you've learned about the letter Q in like a a, a quick summary? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I I was attracted to it because it was is always used as an exoticizing um signifier, like in, in a more kind of Roman alphabet. Like so they use Q to um whenever there's like an indigenous language that they have to kind of put into an English script like they use Q because it looks exotic mm -hmm. and then um it's also used in Middle Eastern languages and in Chinese and other Asian languages Q is used a lot and it looks special right it looks more it looks more foreign um in yeah um including in you know Canadian South American indigenous um transcriptions of the language and I'm, i know i'm missing some but q in english and in, it, it comes a lot out of the latin of course um and uh so is tied quite a bit to that but then from the latin so it, so it kind of made its way up with the roman empire and then made its way into england and so it, and then around the time of um the the um norman conquest of england Q came to replace W in a lot of um, the more um, like Anglo-Saxon um, ways of uh, pronouncing or, or, or transcribing. So, so Q was used for quite a long time also. So, so what used to be why, what, where became replaced by Q, like, and then it became qua. Um, and so it, it was like, there's a slippage between, especially those, um, like can, qua, um, quel, all those things. There was a slippage of that writing into the English and into like Anglo-Saxon, and then it came went back to W again. But so there was this kind of 
so there's yeah I'm, I'm interested in how the the lang the, the 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 letter itself migrated and 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 evolved with from one language to another and so the q origins kind of goes through all of that is I'm, I'm really interested in linguistics too i mean i'm, I'm no expert i have a like not super huge interest in it, but I, I like um, discovering um, the history of language and figuring out how it changes over time. Uh, and then it's used in science a lot because it's a very it's 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 like quantity, quality, quantum. It's it's very prevalent in sciences for a reason. So um, it has a special status that I really. And then I remember when I was a kid, loving to. Um, you know, when we all, I don't know if people still do it because we're all doing computer stuff, but you know, like there's this like dotted line like, and I always love the cue. So it's also aesthetic. It's a very Baroque letter for me. And I love Baroque art and I love all things Baroque. So, yeah. That was my thought. I think I said quick summary, but what I meant oh, really sorry. was like, no, no, no. What I meant was like, it's essence. It's essence. Yeah. Do you, do you find Pleasure. it? Essence Baroque. Do you have a... Baroque. It's that's Baroque. It. Yeah. It's okay. kind of like it can be done, and like that's what one of the the pleasures of the of the cal calligraphy was like. There's so many ways of doing the tail, and then also like the tail is very important because que like q jumping comes from the word que in French, which means tail, and the, and then the letter has a tail, right? And so I, I I ponder quite a bit um the tail in terms of what we've lost and what animals have. So it kind of provides this this metaphor for like human versus animal too, which it's really, I'm glad you asked the question because that's a big part of the book. Like the, probably the largest, the longest chapter is about human animal distinction and then losing the tail. And then what the tail functions as with animals is a beautiful, um, like quite short section on, on the tail. Yeah. And what it is like physiognomy in terms of physiognomy, like what, what it, what it helps, what it expresses and, how it, it it helps with mobility, but also like, you know, a dog wagging its tail is like so expressive. I, I'm living with a dog right now and it it does this cue like thing. Like it, it comes up to me and like puts its butt up against my leg and then curves and then the, the tail was like this. And it just and then it, and it's excited and it's like hi, hi, hi. And it's like and I was like, that's cue. <laughs> so I call him curly Q. I call him curly Q. It's so cute. Anyway, that's a new thing. That's a new cute thing for me. <laughs> it always just keeps expanding. Um, yeah. Eddie. <laughs> Hi. Yeah. If if you were gonna do one letter next, what would it be? Yeah. I I just I told I keep telling everyone I'm never gonna do anymore because the, the exoticizing ones are done the Q and the and the and the and the and the X are kind of done and those are the ones that are kind of the most um visually and yeah they they, they have there's something about the history in those letters that you can really like sink into historically maybe W would be interesting J is also rare. Like J is a really rare letter and K as well, especially in French. It's very rare. So like, but who knows? Maybe, maybe JK <laughs> together. Like a really basic one. Yeah. Well, I've always loved the, um, Georges Perec, who actually wrote a whole novel without using the letter E. Yeah. In French. So, um, yeah, that, that's, and then Unoya by Christian Bach, which is uh, all, like using only the vowels to create poetry, which is really beautiful too. So yeah, I quite enjoy. So what was your question again? Sorry. Just what would the next one be if there was going to be a next one? Yeah, no, I thought there was a sub question. Oh, the sub question was, would you ever do a basic letter yeah, that isn't letter. like rare? That's a good question, actually. Right now, I kind of don't want to, I want to write a really small book. <laughs> so maybe, maybe. Yeah, you never know. Thank you. Oh, I just wanted to ask, what's the best letter? The best. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I just need to know, like, objectively. Mm. I don't think I have a best letter. <laughs> okay, of course. <laughs> It's since childhood. I'm, I'm worried about all the other letters. Yeah. I'm worried about they're a little offended right now. Yeah. They were all required for this, but yeah. 
<laughs> like he was in a way it was also a um the book also includes like a critique of uh sovereignty and mastery and maybe q has this because so much of the q jumping is like is about the negative like i i do wallow in the negative quite a bit and so q maybe speaks of this kind of mastery because there always has to be a you that's like subservient mm -hmm. so so i am critiquing the the history of language in a way too and how it comes out of this kind of roman conquest and has taken over the world so um good question mm -hmm. i mean good observation about how the other letters would be mm -hmm. jealous because in a way that's what power does <laughs> <laughs> just like it created like new thoughts that i hadn't even realized that it was always kind of subliminal to everything yeah. it's great it's fun oh, it's I, fun for me <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm wondering if if it was fun to write an itinerary of the aging body, and but also, like, why do that when the reality is so harsh? Well, you you heard me laughing while I was doing it. I guess, yeah, it's really hard to age in some ways, but I feel like um, what the the trade off is the confidence you get because you're like, who cares anymore? And like, I think in terms of a woman's body. Um, I, it's such a relief to become invisible and not be a sexualized, um, yeah, being. Um, on the on the other hand, yeah, it sucks to feel the aches and pains, and um, but I, I guess I I've always had this attraction of attraction repulsion to um, the biological, and so, and a lot of my artwork reflects that um, kind of uh, you know really immersing myself in grotesque imagery. And 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 like I I actually can't like you know how in art you're supposed to like rationalize everything you do theorize and like you know I can't I can't with that it's it, it was from a childhood of having medical books around the house and looking at them and going oh my god and then wanting to look ah. so it's this right so part of the writing of it was like oh and then looking at yourself and going ah oh. but then like really enjoy like. There is enjoyment in the listing of the things. I mean, it's part of the cue of the symptoms of the body. I don't know. It's and then I like being disgusting. I like the gross. I mean, there's a whole section on disgust in the in the book. So it fits in with the disgust. So part of me enjoys the decomp decomposition. And then I then I I'm part of me is like humans get over it like you're not the most important things in the world and you think you are and we all act like we do and and so part of it is cutting it down to size but yeah I, I had to do my own I had to do a woman's body I had to do my own body you know and I think it's a big part of menopause and you know getting going from that moment 40s to 50s it's tough but it's like I was inspired by Lisa Robertson's book to get into the sheet Andy and to and to just like just lay it all out for everyone to read this is what's going on what we try to ignore is that a good answer or do you want more there's an online question that might might be oh, sorry unless you have more um there's a one of the online questions is how do you describe when how do you describe slash when do you mark the moment of decay for bodies that don't experience menopause yeah don't know I it's it's um I don't have an answer because it, it was kind of about me <laughs> <laughs> and like there's a lot of memoir in it yeah because I um part of it like I didn't read the section but part of the book was really um a way of taking all this theory and all this literary stuff and and all the art that I'm I'm looking at and loving and then and then actually putting myself in at the center of the book in my subject position and say Okay, from my perspective, like, how am I, how is this reflecting how I am immersing myself in the theory? And then what are my responsibilities as a human being towards all this theory? And so I I can only, I can only approach that through my relationship with others, but, you know, from my subject position and with all the, all the privilege and flaws and, and the narrowness of that, but how do, and also like, it was a way to expand my mind through communities, intersecting communities within the book. So I actually don't know about that, about a body that doesn't go through menopause and I didn't broach that and I haven't thought about it. So it's a good question. And I'm sorry, I can't answer it. 
there's another uh, question that's maybe a bit of a departure, um, which is, do you have any thoughts to share about the scale, the encyclopedic quality of the book? This seems important to me. Thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've always been interested in the encyclopedic um this idea of a compilation, like an authoritative, definitive compilation of knowledge. And so this is a bit of an anti-knowledge all around Q because it's just the one letter. Um, yeah, there's something highly suspect about it, about trying to encompass the world in a, through an alphabetic, um, you know, um, queuing of books. <laughs> and uh had a thought there that um, it's just disappeared for a second. It will come back. Oh yeah, and then when I was um, doing my French literature degree, I was really there was a the the encyclopedia of um, uh, De Lambert and Diderot, and it was uh, they had compiled all these drawings based on, um, yeah, like instruments of work and yeah it was kind of a compilation of knowledge and science and of its time and it was it was trying to create the first encyclopedias and so I think I I you know I bought this book and I and I love the drawings and, and and so a lot of my aesthetic is kind of based on this kind of putting all these things on one sheet of paper but I do it nonsensically but I think I'm I'm, I'm in, I've always been interested in this and then I when I was a kid I would because I was I was learning English after I my first language is French. And so I always felt like I wasn't as good with language. So I actually had this book with A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And then I would write my favorite words in it. And then I would like fill each. Yeah. And so, and I, some, some of it, like, I, it is like a really silly thing to say and like to admit, but I would actually look to the, <laughs> the Reader's Digest. It's, I was very young. And you know how they have like the word things, like special words. And I would like look at the Reader's Digest and go, oh, that's a good word would be like um um what would be like one of them I'm just panicking now but it was no I had some of my favorite words in there so um so yeah I would make my own compilations of dictionaries and then illustrate them a bit and yeah so it's been a lifelong thing of um how to learn language from a position of um being foreign to it and then uh and then learning grammar I love learning grammar I was good at it you know, because I think when you're learning a language from a different language and you're learning it through grammar, you also like the language starts to make sense to you through the structure. Um, but it's a very different way of thinking too, and not necessarily like coming out of lived experience, but out of analysis. So I've always had a bit of that scientific trying to organize things in an absurd form. And I know it's like it's taken it to the absurd format and the excess. But yeah, I don't I don't want to do that again kind of got it out of my system but I'm happy it's done <laughs> I'm happy it took 17 years and it's out of my system <laughs> yeah <laughs> nice one <laughs> this has been fun well thank you maybe we should uh end the formal part thanks there. for all the questions and thank you to Good everyone comments. who joined from online and, and contributed questions. And um, yeah, it's it's great. Thanks, Marina, for being here. And uh, and we there are refreshments and we can mill about and chat. And I'll put the shop back to way, the way it normally is with the chairs out of the way. And you can hang out a little bit. Yeah, let's okay. do that. Thanks. Thanks to everyone who came in um, online. Is it already shut down? No. Nope, okay. Thank you, everyone. Bye.